uh, work with um, children and uh, uh, their mental and emotional challenges as well as uh, all the way uh, through addictions and trauma and, and I've had a, a wonderful career uh, doing that and keep learning and growing as we, as we do. But we learned uh, some time ago that if you're going to work with trauma, you have to understand pain. And um, pain is obviously something that um, everyone deals with in some form or another. And we want to tell you a little bit about our story, uh, how uh, and what has uh, pricked our interest in, in presenting this, this subject, chronic pain. Uh, two years ago, in November, actually 2016, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous day. You might remember it. Uh, it, was just, it was just beautiful. And uh, I was at home and I was getting uh, the, uh, uh, the many things done that I wanted to try to get done in a day. And uh, there was a branch hanging over the house uh, right above uh, my wife and I's bedroom and it would scratch and it would sound bad in the wind and the whole nine yards. And she was working and I was at home and I thought, I'm going to get that branch off there. This time I thought and thought and thought, how am I going to do this? I got my ladder, got it secured and everything and things are just going really great until all of a sudden the next thing I know I'm on the ground. And uh, I don't know how I got there, all I know is that uh, it really was uh, very painful and um, uh, oh no, this is not good. My wife is really going to be mad at me now. <laughs> and um, uh, so, uh, you know, laying there and uh, kind of in a daze, uh, wiggled my toes, um, tried to bend my knees and so forth, just doing a, a little bit of a checkup to say, am I paralyzed? Thank you, good Lord, I'm not paralyzed, uh, but I'm not in good shape either. So I tried to get up and uh, realized I r broke my wrist uh, in the fall and uh, uh, somehow or another I got to get up and went to do that, fell again, laid there for a few minutes and my, I've got to get, I got to get up. My wife's not going to be home till 9 o'clock tonight. I don't want her to find me here. I shut the water off because I was cleaning out the water heater and I had chicken soup cooking on the stove and a load of laundry in. I got to get in the house and make sure that I shut the stove off, you know, and get the water back on. And just all these things were whirling around in my head, as you would imagine, in shock. And uh, in the whole shock experience, what I do, Chris, I got in my Prius and I drove my car to the Niles ER in that condition. <laughs> And everybody shakes their head, what in the world's wrong with you? <laughs> uh, so uh, two and a half years later, um, I have a fusion in my back from breaking back in four places. I just last Tuesday was in St. Louis uh, working with a nerve specialist, a complex nerve specialist, Dr. Susan, Susan McKinnon. Um, and uh, my arm, if you could see, it looks like I was in a gang fight because I've got stitches and bruises and <laughs> all kinds of things from nerve damage that, um, that has been very, very, very painful to my hand, and burning, uh, stinging, just really my hand was about half use uh, because of that. Even though the bone healed, the other things weren't healing. So um, that's a little bit of my story in what it's like to experience chronic pain. And uh, we're going to break that down in a few minutes and help us to understand well, what's the difference between acute pain and chronic. But I want you to hear Chris's story because she has some things too to share about her pain. If we start to interfere, we, you can turn off your mic for a okay. minute. But um, yeah, uh, I see all kinds of people, um, uh, lots of uh, a variety of things that people come for. And I'm seeing a lot of chronic pain uh, issues. And the older I get, the more I'm starting to recognize what that feels like <laughs> myself. Um, uh, when I was, t I'm, I know I don't look much more than 27, but it was a few years ago when I was in a plane accident in 20, uh, when I was 27 and fractured my back and got internal injuries and a bunch of things, but my leg. Um, and I, you know, recovered, um, but there's chronic things associated with that. You know, and you, and, and you try to live. You try to live. Um, uh, I recently was delighted to hear that I have severe osteoarthritis in my knee. I need a knee, train, you know, a knee uh, replacement. So, you know, I mean, this affects everybody in so many different ways. Um, so we just 
didn't want to stand up here and uh, not share with you that we have struggles, you know, uh, also, and we understand um, what a struggle it can be. Um, so uh, we wanted to share that uh, with you to let you know a little bit about our background. Thank you for listening. And um, as we now proceed, we want to help you understand a couple things, uh, a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, we, uh, we do use medical services, just so that you know. Um, we are not advocating that medicine is not a part of uh, the process of, of pain, chronic pain uh, treatment, uh, but we have been privileged to be trained uh, by some excellent specialists in the area of chronic pain and learn that there are things that we can do in association with our, our pain uh, medical management. Uh, so honestly, two weeks ago I had injections in my back, uh, had surgery last week, I'm taking pain medication because if I didn't, it wouldn't be a good scene right now. Uh, but uh, all the things that we're, we've learned uh, are pearls, if you will, that will bring and hopefully make a difference on how do we, how do we cope. So pain from the conversation that we want to present tonight is to understand how did we get from acute pain to chronic pain? And chronic pain is going to be our focus this evening as how it gets to that point. And we understand that um, there are many different types of pain. If we, uh, if we could do a little survey within our group here tonight, we would find that some, some folks here are suffering from emotional pain. Some are suffering from uh, accidents. Uh, some are suffering from loss uh, of maybe a body part uh, in some form or another. Um, we, could, we could really spend all evening, I'd love to have that time with you to understand, well, what are you suffering from? But one of our biggest concerns in pre presenting and what we often see in the clinic are people that are suffering from fibromyalgia, lupus, and other kinds of pain that on the outside, you don't see it. It doesn't look like it should be a problem. So just imagine you're going to your favorite um, retail and uh, you've got five uh, uh, parking places for, uh, for those who are, are needing uh, handicap parking. And um, people get out of the car and they look just fine. Like, what's wrong with you? Why do you have to have a, um, uh, a special place in parking? But one thing that I have certainly learned about uh, the struggle of recovery and that kind of thing, that walking from my car to Meyer and just getting through the fruit department, I am absolutely exhausted. And in that process, uh, I can hardly make it back to my car. You know, and, and again, on the outside, it looks like, okay, you should be fine. Why, why are you doing that? So a lot of things that we don't understand in terms of lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and other things, is that there's a lot of things that we look kind of normal in, uh, but the truth is if you get below that, what, what's really going on are these things that our people are suffering from and the things that are often misunderstood. So even if you go to visit your physician and you're saying, hey, I've, I've got some of these symptoms, it may be, well, okay, I've, I've only got 15 minutes to talk to you and okay, why don't you take this muscle relaxer and hopefully everything will be okay. But there's not just one thing going on here. And of course, that's what we wanna share with you tonight that we, we realize and understand in chronic pain that, that there's many things going on at the same time. So if we take uh, the uh, concept of acute pain, we're going to look at that from the perspective that that's, that's an injury. If you uh, cut your finger, if you, even a paper cut, ouch, that really hurts, right? Um, in time, that's going to heal. If you've got a toothache, you go uh, to the dentist and you, you do something about that. Or if you have a headache, you might take some aspirin or whatever. But if that pain doesn't uh, resolve within a certain amount of time, obviously, we're going to need more attention to that. And we give that attention um, through, well, like, how, how am I built with my pain sensations? You've heard people say, well, you really have a high uh, pain tolerance. You know, like, you can really go through a lot and experience a lot. Well, back in the beginning, 
it wasn't quite like that. <laughs> I, I may have been able to, you know, just kind of blow off a, a little paper cut, but that pain sensation started sending a real important message that pain is not good uh, of any kind, of any kind. Uh, so my thoughts about my pain, the f emotions I have about my pain, the suffering that I go through, like I can't sleep. Or I go to bed and I sleep for an hour or two, but then I'm awake for three or four more hours um, in the process of trying to get sleep. So I'm suffering sometimes very silently, sometimes outwardly, like I got the grumpies and people don't understand why are you so grumpy. Well, I'm I'm hurting, I'm suffering, and, and I'm, I'm having these uh, challenges that, that I go through. And then there's pain behaviors that, uh, that we experience as well, like some people are very silent and quiet about their pain, where others are obviously more vocal about their pains and maybe even stop doing important things in their life, socially and emotionally and otherwise. Well, I'd like to... Uh, give you a perspective real quick on the concept of, of the cycle of pain. And we want to uh, just kind of uh, look at this as, excuse me, <laughs> somewhat of an, uh, an agreement. Uh, everyone, to some way or another, wants to avoid pain. Anybody here enjoy pain? Raise your hands, please. <laughs> Come up here and do this. No. Uh, so we're all in agreement that in whatever way, we're going to do something to uh, avoid the pain. Well, um, if, uh, if that pain doesn't go away, uh, then we have a decreased mobility. Now, before I had my accident, I was a chronic headache sufferer. Uh, so I had many, many migraine years in my life. And I learned how to to deal with the migraine by saying, you know, probably the best place for me is pillow over my head and sheets uh, covering me up and I'll see you in a day or so because I can't function <laughs> with, that, uh, with that headache like that. And then there's uh, alternative or alternate functions. And that's where I may need to have something that will come along and serve with me in, my, in my, uh, my pain. And for me, this is my alternative functioning. I, I have to have a cane because I lose my balance. And even as much as to say, um, about six weeks ago, the doctor said, I think you need a walker. I turned 60 and I have a walker. I'm not feeling so <laughs> so good about that. So uh, uh, so my my functioning and my ability to get around, I had to have some kind of an apparatus for that. Um, my next step in this is uh, diminished. Sorry about that. Function and self esteem. And so when you talk to folks who are real chronic sufferers of pain, uh, they feel less than of their self-worth, their self-valuing, I can't do, I want to do, I want to be around and, and be just like everyone else. And that's changing. That's not like it used to be. And then there's the, um, the humiliation factor. And believe me, it was very hard when I went to the DMV back in December and with my doctors proud, prodding and many other friends, you need to get a disabled placard for your cart. <laughs> so, uh, so as you see kind of what's going on here, um, fear plays a big role in this. And we don't have time to talk about everything tonight, but, uh, but as you can see how it goes, if I'm avoiding, I'm careful and so forth, that's, more, that's normal to things are becoming abnormal all the way to my greatest fear is, man, I'm really in pain and my function, functionability has really decreased. And this is, again, moving out of the acute pain into more chronic pain. And just a, just a quick look at this, um, what we want you to understand is that um, there is a, a challenge here that in acute pain you can say, 
I know on certain day, a certain point in time, um, I had enough incisions to have 100 stitches in my arm right now. I know I can go back to that and say, you know, that's going to hurt because on that day, here's the problem. But as the pain is uh, going further, duration of pain, usually we figure anywhere from um, two months, maybe even to six months, somewhere in the gap, there's, a, there's some differing opinions on that. If that pain lasts that long, then that becomes chronic pain. So we move out of acute pain into chronic pain, and then we get into the treatment approaches, of course, are going to be different depending upon where your uh, pain is occurring. And a lot of times, we don't know. Now, in an accident or a fall, car accident or anything like that, yeah, you've got some pretty good understanding. Hey, they're literally through the imaging and that kind of thing, we can tell where that problem happened. But in fibromyalgia, lupus, and other uh, MS problems, things like that, that have to do with nerve and neuropathy, uh, it's really hard to fully understand what's going on. When I went to the doctor in St. Louis um, that is a complex nerve specialist, and she was going uh, through some uh, really important things to understand, um, does this affect you, does this affect you, does that affect you, and that kind of thing. And one of the most interesting uh, things that she did, ladies and gentlemen, is she just took her finger and rubbed underneath my arm here, and I felt an electrical response like, wow, I could not believe. And she's, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, and, and, and her specialty, oh yeah, now that makes some sense, and, and follows and maps that out into figuring out that I not only have ulnar problems, uh, but I also have radius problems of nerves. The nerves are all bundled, and they're not making sense. So in chronic pain, uh, the nervous system remodels continuously in response to repeated pain signals. Real, real briefly on this, what we want to try to present is that the, the brain, the command center of the brain, is critical in, uh, in the understanding of what's going on in chronic pain. So if we understand there's a, there's a in our spinal cord, there are, there are tons and tons of different fibers of, of messaging going on from the brain. And the nerve that is uh, injured or wounded is sending a message to the brain, ouch, that hurts. Remember that pain sensation right at the very beginning of the acute, and it moves up. As that's happening, the nerve becomes hypersensitive to pain. It remembers that pain, and then it becomes somewhat, well, if you will, hypersensitive to pain. So right now I can tell you if I stand still and I don't move, I'm not going to be able to move my legs very well because the, the nerves that have become resistant, that have become hyper, if you will, in the antiseptive system are saying there's pain, don't move. There's pain, don't flex. There's pain. And that, that pain sends that message of, well, I think I'd rather just sit down right now than take that walk. But if I, in the chronic pain signals, become embedded in the nervous system and I understand what's going on there, then I'm able to speak to that. And Chris is going to talk more about that in a few minutes. Yes, ma'am. Can, can you go back one slide? Sure. The, the okay. Uh, the the uh, nociceptive is... Um, that nerve uh, messaging to the brain. It says it's, it's uh, very sensitive to pain, okay? And it says, stop what you're doing, that hurts, don't do that anymore. Antinoceptive is basically saying, uh, block that. And in blocking it, it says essentially, stay in pain, okay? So if we stay in pain, then we're gonna be less willing or less able to move forward to do whatever is task or movement that we need to make. Does that make sense? All right, I'll it, it. Okay, it's, it's a hard <laughs> one. <laughs> it's it's okay. really what's going on in the nervous system uh -huh. and what basically an antiseptive system is saying, it has memory, okay? And the memory, it's saying when that hurts, that doesn't feel good. You don't want to do that. The nociceptive system is saying, 
back to the avoid, avoid pain. Okay, if that hurts or if you're bleeding, go get a Band-Aid, okay, and it'll go away. Antiseptic, no, nociceptive is saying the pain is sending you that message. You don't, you don't want to do that. Okay, so that's something separate from the nervous system. That's correct, and it can get locked in to the point that you are unable to function in the way that we want to function. So that we come back here to the fear, what's going to happen if I move, okay? And I decrease my mobility. Well, yeah. and then on okay. goes the, the cycle then. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. What's the answer, keep walking? Actually, yes, and we'll give you some, some pearls of wisdom to know how to do that, okay? Um, I, I put this in here because I just want you to see that we are, we are really trying to, again, take a very broad perspective in our discussion tonight, that anything from migraines all the way to muscular skeletal pain and that kind of thing, that there's a lot of things that are going on at one time. So if you're a diabetic sufferer and you have a lot of neuropathy and that kind of thing, um, we, we are aware that your pain is going to be burning, stinging, uh, agitating kind of pain, almost like I can't put my feet on the ground because the bottom of my feet are so highly triggered uh, that, that that hurts, I don't want to do that. And as you can see, the different uh, classes of uh, problems that we can, we can have. So from cancer to diabetes to uh, birth defects to accident, you know, in all of this in some way or another, uh, we're, we're saying that if pain isn't identified and cared for, it's going to move into chronic pain. And that chronic pain then is what essentially can paralyze us if we're not able to treat it correctly. So uh, here's other things that can be uh, certainly mixed together. Um, that we want to also make sure that you understand that when we're talking about chronic pain, we're talking big uh, universal language unless we're able to identify it as muscular skeletal or nerve or whatever. But most of everything that you see there, these are things that do often, uh, well, they, they intercept with one another and one problem can very easily cause another problem. So, Folks, if you are chronic pain sufferers, you will know that um, things uh, get a little bit crazy. Life isn't quite like um, you've known it to be, and if you've suffered pain all of your life, uh, maybe all of this may not make sense, or it will be, yes, this makes a great deal of sense. It's exactly what, what, I, what I live with day in, day night. So we wanted to give you that, and then also to, uh, understand that you know the the inevitables don't necessarily have to be the inevitables uh, if we stay locked in to the chronicity and the mental emotional responses and reactions of course that's gonna uh, that's gonna lock us in and we're going to be be alone and suffer uh, in many many great ways our goal tonight would be are there ways that that suffering can be exposed and turn into some real tangible good ways that we can uh, operate and function in our life in spite of some of the difficulties that we may have. So Chris is gonna come and share those with us now. Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sure. Mm -hmm. Sorry, get you on the right one there. Thank you. <coughs> so, um, so what, what I'm uh, going to talk about is what can we do about pain outside of medical treatment. Um, as I, I mean, I hope it was clear, we're counselors, we're not uh, medical providers. We cannot um, write prescriptions for pain medications and so on. But what we're seeing is that there's um, a lot of, uh, there's being a change in uh, pain management, and there's a, a reluctance to um, get people, allow people to get addicted, or the possibility of addiction. So um, they're very cautious about uh, uh, prescribing medication. So we're seeing more people that are saying, "I need 
other ways, if there is any other way. So pain is unavoidable. We're going to have it. Uh, but suffering, what we want to say, is optional. Um, so um, just wait a second. Yeah, the reality is that pain cannot always be eliminated. Um, and what, our, what we can control sometimes is our relationship to the pain. Are we going to, to what degree can we not allow pain to dictate our lives or diminish our lives, you know? Um, uh, does the pain control you? Or how much personal power do you hand over to the pain? Um, and you know, I'm not diminishing pain is, is bad. I, I see him uh, come to work every day for the last two years in excruciating pain, and yet he continues to move forward. I admire that because I've also seen, I mean, there's other choices. You can shut down and, you know, um, but it's not a good, it's not a good option. We want to live. We, we want to. So we have to kind of have the attitude that we're going to fight it. Um, or learn, not, uh, learn to live in spite of some of the pain. Um, so our goal is to reduce suffering and try to live life to the fullest. Um, this is the, the, uh, the suffering is optional part, is the self-talk we need to keep ourselves working at it and not give up on it. Um, so there's, so I'm going to talk about pain management tools. Um, there's kind of two sections. This is just what I'm going to talk about tonight. Manage your brain and body health. Hydration, nutrition, exercise, pacing, and sleep. I'll touch a little bit on all those things, but those have not much to do, if anything, with medication um, and a lot to do with your lifestyle and what, you know, things that you might be able to control. Um, and then the second part I'll talk about is what I call managing your mind. What, uh, what can we do with the thoughts? that we're in charge of that might either make our pain worse or better, um, our experience of the pain worse or better. So I learned some amazing stuff uh, about hydration that I just want to share with you because, boy, this is a simple thing that we can do. 75% um, of people are dehydrated. And uh, the Amount, um, uh, the amount of water in your body is directly related to brain function. So our brain is 85% water. You don't have to be low on fluids very much for it to start to affect the way your brain functions. Um, without enough water, the brain becomes inefficient. And we'll, I'm just going to mention three things. Memory suffers and, you know, as as a person who's getting older, I notice that a lot. Um, our cognitive skills will fall. So things that we can do or think through easily when we're hydrated and feeling well uh, become difficult when we're dehydrated. And the important part of this for the purposes of talking about pain is when we're dehydrated even a little bit, we start to experience greater pain sensitivity. Um, now, I'm not sure how all of that happens, but, um, uh, oh, well, here I, I'm getting, uh, I've got to tell you all the other stuff. Okay. As little as a 2% decrease in water content causes a loss of alertness and fatigue. And by the t you're already 2% dehydrated when you're thirsty for a drink of water. That's what I mean by thirst is a late indicator of dehydration. So, if you find yourself thirsty, start drinking that water because you're already 2% low, okay? Um, and uh, severe dehydration is uh, between 12 and 15% low, and you can die from that. So we need water. We need a lot of it. Um, chronic dehydration causes such things as headaches, fatigue, increased pain sensitivity, and many other health problems. Um, 
always happy to learn about this because I, I've had migraines forever. And um, uh, medication doesn't manage it very well. So I, most of the time I can work through them and just, you know, keep moving and keep doing. Um, but I'm pretty sure that I'm chronically dehydrated. I'm working my best to try to change my habits so that, you know, gosh, if drinking, uh, you know, uh, an extra, you know, water during the day can make a difference in my headaches, man, I'm going to try it. It doesn't cost anything for me to try that. <clears throat> nutrition, and I, I want to make clear, I'm not a dietitian or a nutritionist, but uh, sometimes, you know, we know about things and sometimes when to refer people um, to get some information. But foods, there are foods that cause inflammation in our bodies, and inflammation is associated with pain. Uh, so this is just very brief. Um, processed sugars trigger the release of inflammatory messengers called cytokines. So you can look up cytokines if you want, but um, the more important thing is to learn that food affects our pain sensitivity. Saturated fats, um, such things as pizza and cheese, trigger inflammation of adipose tissue, tissue and adipose tissue is fat tissue. Um, and again, there's that inflammation. Trans fats um, uh, are what is found in hydrogenated oils. If you look at ingredients, it says partially hydrogenated oil in there. That means there's a lot of trans fat. And that triggers overall systemic inflammation. Um, excess omega-6 fatty acids, oils such as corn, safflower, sunflower, things like mayonnaise and many salad dressings have a lot of omega-6. Um, there's all, you may have heard of omega-3. They're not, they're two different things, okay? Omega-6 fatty acids can be the problem and that triggers the body to produce pro-inflammatory chemicals. So it contributes to the inflammation. Um, refined carbohydrates, uh, such as white flour products, white rice, white potatoes, and many cereals contain refined carbohydrates. Um, these produce uh, the production of, uh, I'll tell you what it's called, advanced glycation end products. Don't know what that means. All I know that they stimulate inflammation, okay? <laughs> so um, excess alcohol has a lot of you know, negative side effects, but it also uh, causes inflammation. And monosodium glutamate, which sometimes we call MSG, triggers two important pathways of chronic inflammation. So um, it's something to know. And if you're interested in nutrition and, uh, you know, go talk to your doctor, look things up, try to learn about it, and maybe you can have some improvement. Uh, you know, a little bit more improvement in your pain by what you're eating. Um, if you're sensitive to the following, they can cause inflammation. Not everybody's sensitive to these things, so it, this is uh, only if it applies to you. But wheat and dairy cause uh, increased joint pain because of inflammation. And aspartame will trigger an inflammatory response if it's something that you're sensitive to. So, um, uh, you know, there's more that we might, that, that, that contributes or may be contributing to our pain that we're not even aware of that we can look into and maybe, you know, improve it a little bit along the way. <clears throat> um, exercise, uh, in which someone asked a question about exercise. The first thing is check with your doctor. Um, we want to make sure it's safe for you to exercise. But safe means that you might still hurt. It's just that you're not going to be causing any harm, OK? So it's OK to exercise in many, many, many cases, even if you're hurting. And not only is it OK to, it's extremely important to. Inactivity leads to increased pain through stiff muscles, decreased mobility, and decreased strength. Um, if you wait until you feel better, you're never going to exercise. I see somebody nodding their head. That's exactly right. So there's a saying that exercise is medicine. It's very, very important to, to exercise. 
and it's a really important strategy in managing the pain. So find an activity that you enjoy. Um, and I've never, I've never liked exercise. I'm quite, I'll be honest with you about that. I don't like to sweat. I'm sweating just standing here, you know? So, but, but there are things that I've found that I'm willing to do and that I enjoy. So um, here's some, not necessarily that I do, but that I've heard people like to do. Um, walking, bicycling, gardening, that's good exercise, cardio drumming. I've got someone who does that, and you, you sit and do that. Um, and it gets your cardiovascular system working, and you get to pound out some of your frustrations at the same time. Kayaking, dancing, I'm sure there's many more things that you can think of. You don't have to go jogging to get exercise. Um, and there's three types of exercise that we want to think about. Stretching is real important. Um, cardiovascular when we increase our heart rate and strengthening exercises. Now, with, along with exercise, we have to talk about pacing, right? My brain says go, but my body says no. Um, what we want to do is find balance. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I went uh, recently to Arizona for a, a, a week and uh, I wanted uh, to go hiking, um, actually mountain climbing. And, um, and I mentioned I have severe osteoarthritis, and so before I left, I was, I begged my doctor for medication and got a shot in my knee, a cortisone shot in my knee. Ah, oh, I felt like a new person. And uh, until I got about halfway up the mountain, and um, it, was, it was bad. Uh, almost didn't make it back down the mountain. <laughs> but in fact, going down is worse than going up when you got a bad knee, yeah. So I was not pacing myself. My brain was going, you've been able to do this in the past. You can do it now. You just have to try harder. Well, I can't do it. I needed to take it at a pace that wasn't going to overtax my, my problems, you know. Um, so be realistic about what you can do. Um, that's a, you know, my experience was a good example of overestimating what, what I can or should do. Um, and, and then we create a pain flare up. In other words, the pain gets really bad. So we stop doing anything and we're back in a bad place again. Um, so another example of pacing is, um, you know, having an arthritic knee doesn't not mean that you cannot walk, usually. It doesn't mean you cannot walk, but it may mean you have to walk more slowly. Uh, maybe you have to walk on level ground, uh, and maybe you need to walk for shorter distances. So that's kind of what I mean by pacing. And this is a good thing to, to help you know whether you're pacing yourself well. Um, this is a like a pain measurement scale. You may have seen these in doctor's offices. Um, they'll say, how bad is your pain? And you point to one. Um, so like I mentioned at first is you can exercise. Uh, I mean, if provided your doctor says it's okay, there's a few things that exercise can aggravate uh, uh, the problem, but most things don't. Anyway, let's say you're feeling, you wake up and you're feeling in, in moderate pain, which is right here at a four. Um, and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for a walk. Um, so you set out, even though you're in, in moderate pain. Um, if your pain starts to increase, which it may, right, because you're trying to build up your, your strength and your, and your endurance and stuff, if it starts to get up here two points higher, stop, stop, okay? It's time to stop. That's what pacing means, okay? And... Um, and rest up, and the next day, take another walk. You'll have a better idea of maybe how far you can comfortably go. Sleep is huge. This is, uh, pain of course is the main culprit for those who have difficulty falling asleep or, or uh, for those who have difficulty staying asleep. So this is, um, but sleep is a big problem because it's, 
uh, it's critical to treat and our sleep and uh, disorders and get good sleep. Um, when we're sleeping well, we feel better, we have more energy, and we're in a better mood. Um, clearly, those, those things are true. Um, sleep is critical to the recuperation of tissues that are damaged. Um, so the bottom line is that poor sleep quality increases pain sensitivity again, and it also increases depression symptoms. Um, so even if we deal in our office when we work with people who come in, even if they don't have any pain, we usually uh, are asking about sleep very early in, in the time we're getting to know them because uh, sleep is critically important to wellness. Um, so here's some suggestions of things that you can try. Change habits that disrupt sleep. Um, we do an awful lot of things that uh, make it difficult for us to get good sleep. Um, go to bed, get up at the same time every day, even on the weekends, even on holidays. This is good for your body clock, for regular sleep. Um, no caffeine after 2 p.m. Um, some, some people are more sensitive to caffeine than others, but that can be a big one. Um, do not use alcohol to help you sleep. It may help you fall asleep, but it will cause disrupted sleep, and you will not be getting good quality sleep, and you'll feel it. Um, this is a big one. No electronics for one hour before sleep. And we've got so many electronics in our lives. Um, television is one of them. Um, I think we've seen a, a greater increase in problems since people have been using computers and handheld devices uh, in, you know, as they're laying in bed for, before they go to sleep. And the light from the screens totally interrupts the body clock and, and uh, messes up your ability to fall asleep. Um, so instead, spend an hour before sleep doing a passive, non-stimulating activity. So um, things that might work for people are uh, take a warm bath, read a book, listen to some soft music, the, whatever you like to do. Don't go jogging. Don't, you know, um, don't get in a fight with somebody. That would be stimulating. We don't want that. Um, so we want to, there's things we can do to prepare your brain for sleep. One is increase daytime sunlight exposure. Um, limit artificial light at night. Sleep in a dark room. Um, there are people you know, I run into who say, well, I have to have a light on. Um, well, that's a different kind of a sleep problem, but it's, it's going to affect the quality of your sleep if, if you need to sleep with a light on. So um, manage noise. Um, everyone has different sensitivities. Some people can sleep through a storm. Other people, you know, any sound will wake them up. So there's different options um, that, you know, we can suggest when we're working with people. Um, two of them are earplugs uh, to block out noise, and another is white noise. So, uh, so an example of white noise is having a fan on in your room. Um, so there's, there's different kinds of white noise that will kind of block out, you know, the dog's toenails on the wood floor outside your bedroom and stuff. Um, so that's the idea. Um, use techniques to calm and relax, and we're going to cover some of those in just a minute. Um, yeah. Um, the lights, the full spectrum light mm -hmm. that people use, mm -hmm. um, can you use that in the morning and the night or just in the morning? How do, how do you yeah, that's a good question. That? You know, I mean, I, I don't know the, the correct answer to that. I would say when I've been advised on how to use it, it's use it in the morning because you don't use it for a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, but it stimulates, it stimulates your, your brain, so you wouldn't want to use it at night. It would be likely to keep you awake. I get, okay. Yeah. Um, so you oh. don't want to use it to extend your day. Right, right. Okay. Use it first thing in the morning, yeah. Um, okay, so we did the left side. Now I'm going to just briefly try to do self-talk, relaxation techniques, and social um, connection. Self-talk is so important, and, and this is where we do a lot of this in counseling. 
I love this quote from Henry Ford because it says, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. Um, what you tell yourself predicts outcome uh, pretty well. So I want to ask, you know, do you think of yourself as disabled or differently abled? I think that can make a big difference in how we see ourselves. Um, Brain imaging studies show that expectations of pain light up areas of the brain that signal pain. So for an example is they, were, they did a study where they had a person who had no pain laying down and watching a video of somebody straining their back. This person who had no pain uh, and was laying down, the areas of their brain that signaled back pain lit up all over the place. And they were only watching in you know, someone else's pain. Um, pain. This is another interesting one. Pain studies have shown that patients who believe they are receiving treatment but are not receiving treatment had improvement rates equal to or better than those who actually did receive treatment. So you might have heard of the placebo effect. So again, that goes to what, do you th what are your thoughts? Um, if you think you're getting, the, the, the study that, that I was aware of was uh, one about, oh shoot, what do they call it when they put those needles in you? Uh, yeah. Acupuncture. Acupuncture, thank you. Um, um, if I drank more water, I wouldn't be having these medical problems. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, they did fake acupuncture, and the people didn't know that it was fake acupuncture, and they compared it with people that got real acupuncture, and the people who had fake acupuncture actually had reported better response rates. Um, which, you know, that's interesting. We can maybe use that. I think for us it says what you tell yourself is really important. Um, you are the only one in control of the thoughts that you think. Um, and remember, not every thought we think is accurate. Uh, I think we assume it is, but it's not. It's just not. Um, counseling can help you identify and modify self-talk that you might not be aware of, um, that's not good for you. Um, I don't know if there's any healthcare providers here, but what providers tell their patients influences their expectations. For example, if uh, someone has some back pain, you, the doctor can say it's age-related changes which is normal, right? I mean, we're not happy, but it's normal. As opposed to degenerative disc disease, <laughs> you know? Um, so, I mean, words matter, words matter. So, um, okay, relaxation techniques. Um, identify what already relaxes you. So there's just some examples of things that, uh, and there can be so many other things, I mean, but just, Find out for yourself, what do I find relaxing? What's calming? What makes me smile, you know? Um, and then use those things. Um, engage in those things. Because when you are distracting your mind and your body to do something that you enjoy, you're not going to be noticing the pain as much. Learn and use new techniques. Uh, these are things uh, that we, uh, some of these things we do in our office. Um, slow deep breathing is a, a very, very useful technique for um, helping to manage um, pain and anxiety, by the way. Um, progressive muscle relaxation uh, is a way to try to help you fall asleep at night. Visual imagery, um, that's like using your imagination. So instead of laying in bed, for example, and thinking about, you know, the pain that I'm feeling in my, in my big toe, um, go, I call it going on a, on, a, uh, on, a, on a vacation in your mind. Think about being on a beach in Hawaii and the sun is setting and it's warm and it feels so good. Whatever works for you because somebody else might want to be thinking about camping in the woods and whatever, you know, what works for you. Um, meditation uh, is another technique that has shown uh, a lot of results in helping to manage pain as well as anxiety. And yoga or tai chi, 
I don't believe, I don't teach that in my, uh, but I recommend it. Um, again, you know, uh, the, it's gentle movements, so you're getting some kind of exercise, but it's also mental calming and, and relaxation. Um, the last thing is social connection, and I thought this was interesting. What percentage of women needed extra pain medication during childbirth? 97% of women who perceived that they were alone. 63% of women who felt caring from medical professionals. But only 18% of women needed extra pain medication when they were accompanied at, in delivery by a significant, a caring significant other. You know, I mean, connection makes a difference. Mm -hmm. um, empathy from others affects our experience of pain, so avoid isolating yourself. That's one thing people with chronic pain often do. They, they sit in their home and they don't get out and they don't talk to people. Um, so seek connection. Ask for support. You know, you can't expect people to just provide support. Uh, ask for it. And then um, be, spe be specific in asking for what you need. Um, a couple uh, last thought here is that giving versus receiving. Studies show that individuals who give and focus on others report feeling happier. Um, so volunteering, you know, you, you may be not able to work full time, but maybe you can volunteer somewhere for an hour a week or a couple hours a week in different places, doing something that gives to others. And your focus then is on others instead of on your own, you know, getting stuck on your own pain. Um, so I thank you for your attention and I'm gonna hand it back over to Rich. I know our time is getting away from us. So uh, hopefully what you have heard today that from the, what's going on in the brain, how our brains are identifying um, our pain, we'll call that the central nervous system, and that's uh, also including the sensory neural system, and those systems, they speak to each other, and they keep us uh, obviously going through this cycle that could be very, uh, very uh, much stuck in, and particularly if we get into this diminished uh, self-esteem, humiliation, Perspective. So we're really trying to propose tonight that it's really important to take care of the of the whole person. Uh, the holistic perspective is that we are uh, very mindful that uh, we're made with all these parts: mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, social. And if they're ignored, uh, then that's going to uh, really work on that depression factor. And of course, we're here tonight because. We're very concerned about folks who suffer chronic pain for many, many, many years and have suffered depression all along. And that depression has really made that pain much, much more difficult uh, to overcome and isolating to the degree that it has. Um, we want to have smart goals in our um, approach. So uh, our goals need to be specific and significant. Um, if you get caught up in small things and you are working on you know every trivial thing to be a goal it's not going to happen it just won't so make your goal realistic like today i needed to be very mindful to walk around the building uh, our office building before i came tonight because i was going to be standing a lot and when i stand a lot i locked up pretty fast so i didn't want to make a scene here tonight so i made sure i walked around the building that really helped. Um, evaluate your progress and evaluate it often. Uh, one of the, the dangers of goal setting is we don't evaluate to see if it's working or not, and we tend to fail the goal because we haven't taken time to evaluate it. Uh, make it measurable and meaningful um, so that, you know, hey, this really worked and I accomplished it and I can identify that in times uh, when I may be having other struggles where I feel like, oh, this battle is so long, it's so hard, am I ever gonna feel better? Well, yeah, last week when I walked around the building and I didn't lock up, well, that felt really, really good. So guess what, tomorrow and uh, Saturday and Sunday and so forth, I think I better make sure I'm doing a little bit of walking, moving rather than being sedentary. 
Uh, is it reasonable? Is it action-based? Goals need to be, uh, to be uh, obviously defined and they need to be evaluated, but again, make it reasonable and make it something that is a, a certainly attainable. And talk about that. Um, you know, once you do achieve and you, you have success, it's very good to say, hey, guess what I did today? <laughs> you know, and, and, and it may not mean that much to a family member or a friend or whomever, uh, but when you're smiling and when you're able to find things are working better, it's just gonna give you more encouragement to, to keep making goals. Ask yourself the question, is it relevant, worthwhile, and consistent with, with your need? I cannot walk a mile. There is no way I could walk a, a mile. And so it's real unrealistic for me to plan to walk a mile tonight after our presentation. So in that, um, it wouldn't be very realistic. But would it help me to do a little bit of walking yet tonight before I rest? You bet it would, just to get through the anxiety and the, and the work of the day. Uh, identify what you're aiming toward. Um, in our discussion tonight, we're, we're talking about chronic pain and ways to help aid you through that. To say that I'm going to leave a chronic uh, pain uh, uh, presentation and not, not, and not have pain again, well, obviously, that's unrealistic, isn't it? Um, so I need to make sure that it's timely and, and time limited. So 15 minutes of walking, 15 minutes of a warm bath or what have you, that can be very realistic and, and certainly something attainable. I can't say enough about goals, uh, and I know so many folks get tripped up on, well, I, I, I had goals, but they didn't work, and so why, why do it? Well, I think here's some, some very good, specific things that you can do to be successful. And folks, really, to go through chronic pain, and that's a very big part of your life, to make goals, make them smart, make them work, it's going to feel a lot less humiliating and feeling like I'm attached to this and that's my identity. You're far, far more than your injury or your pain. So we want to work on also some problem solving skills. Kind of seems, sounds very familiar. Define the problem. What, what is the problem? Be specific about the problem. Set the goal. Stop and think about it brainstorm uh, possible solutions. Usually that's good with somebody else. Uh, if you need help doing that, you don't have someone, that's where maybe counseling can be, become very helpful for you. Evaluate consequences. You know, if I walk a mile tonight, uh, how am I gonna do tomorrow? <laughs> no, probably not so good, you know. Uh, pick the best one and try it. Obviously, if that didn't work, go back to number four. So we could, really spend a, a whole session just on this area here, but we, we really want, again, to be thinking, like, okay, if I'm being treated medically and I have medications that are supposed to be taken that will help reduce inflammation, help reduce uh, the, those pain messages, then it's wise for me to not discard what the doctor is recommending for me. Work with your doctor, work with your, your um, nutritionist, work with your family, your friends. It, it is really, really about a team effort. I cannot do this alone. And as Chris said, when I come to work, I have cheerleaders. They're there cheering me on, glad to see you. I was gone a week with my surgery, and people are saying things like, man, it seems like forever since we've seen you. And that just feels good. It just feels good to know that I matter that I, that I count. And a lot of times, pain messages will tell you that you don't, and you get locked into that humiliation, low self-esteem, and so forth. So um, taking care of yourself is really important. Here's some ways uh, to do uh, self-care, and we, we talk a lot about self-care in, uh, in kind of a buzzword of these days, but uh, self-care is very, very important. Uh, uh, to consider in all facets of our life, whether we're struggling with pain or we're a caregiver to someone who is in pain, we can't speak enough to please take care of yourself because if you're not good for you, then obviously you're not gonna be good for others. Well, we need to end our presentation uh, this evening with uh, this material. We could talk uh, for hours about all that we have learned and want to give but we hope this will at least have uh, 
uh, caught some interest, given you some uh, understanding of where chronic pain stems from, and also uh, understanding, well, what are some things that I can begin doing that maybe I've did at one time but stopped doing and maybe need to re uh, re-engage those, re-implement those in, into your life. Uh, can we ask, are there any questions uh, before we end this evening? I yes. Have a comment. Um, my husband has Parkinson's, which is a chronic illness, yes. and a lot of this applies to him as well. Yes. You, you could go speak to that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, when we do see our Parkinson's patients, because there's many levels of Parkinson's, um, it is, yeah, there's so much nerve pain that goes along with that that uh, is often misunderstood or not known. Balance, rigidity, all those complications that go along with that. Yeah, we're very, very much aware of those folks who really suffer often very silently. Yes. Well, and these kinds of things. All that, you Yes, indeed. You know, and then I, I don't think I spoke to the fact that, um, you know, we've pretty much been talking about chronic physical pain, but we know there's chronic emotional pain too. And um, the things that apply uh, to the physical pain also apply to emotional pain, um, that there's help for that, you know? Absolutely. Well, thank you. Sure.